the institutions of the European Union have been going through rapid change because of the Eurozone crisis. And there has been a considerable transfer of power from the national level to the EU level, especially in the field of national economic policies. At the same time, uh, there have been institutional changes introduced by the latest uh, treaty change, namely the Lisbon Treaty entered into force in December 2009, coinciding with the economic crisis. Uh, this lecture offers a brief overview of the core institutions of the EU and their functions, and it highlights uh, some significant changes over the past few years and considers the way forward. Now, the scope of recent changes is illustrated by the following quotations. President of the European Commission, José Manuel Barroso, stated in May 2012 that never in the past have so many competencies been exercised at EU level. A rather positive statement from the mouth of the uh, Commission President. Opposing a much more worried position, the Prime Minister of uh, the United Kingdom, David Cameron, uh, spoke about the EU in January 2013, stating that uh, the European Union that emerges from the Eurozone crisis is going to be a very different body. It will be transformed perhaps beyond recognition. And as you probably know, the UK is seriously considering whether it will want to be part of that different body. Expressing one of the concerns raised by the recent changes, Professor Jürgen Habermas uh, stated in May 2013 in a speech that uh, the ultimate uh, democratization is presented as a promise, like a light at the end of the tunnel. But postpon postponing democracy is a rather dangerous move. And I will come back to the issue of democracy uh, a bit later. Before going into detail of uh, the institutions, uh, let's consider for a moment uh, why do institutions matter? They matter because uh, they reflect uh, the prevailing shared understanding among the member states and other significant actors in the EU about uh, the nature and scope of the EU's tasks. In other words, they define the extent to which uh, member states delegate certain responsibilities to the European Union. Institutions also define power relations between member states and the EU and among the different EU institutions. And they tell a lot about uh, the history of European integration. Uh, prior institutional arrangements always uh, shape what is seen to be possible or appropriate, and they condition the possible way forward. So there is a strong degree of uh, path dependency in how institutions have evolved over decades. Now let's look more closely at uh, the main institutions. The European Commission, the Council of the European Union, European Council, European Parliament, and European Court of Justice. The European Commission resembles national governments in some respects. It is a proto-executive institution with considerable autonomy. But its powers uh, vary greatly between policy domains. And where it has a very strong role traditionally is uh, areas of uh, community method, such as uh, the common agricultural policy and trade policy. In these areas, uh, the Commission is the one that takes uh, the initiative, that uh, prepares legislative acts, proposes them to the member states for decision making, and once uh, the decisions have been taken, it uh, is in charge of implementation. A little bit different uh, mode of integration is called regulatory mode, uh, which is applied, for example, in the areas of competition and single market and environment. Here, the Commission is also agenda setter, but once decisions have been adopted, it has a, a supervisory or policing role. Rather than being directly responsible for implementation, it supervises uh, what uh, member states do 
in uh, terms of implementing the commonly agreed uh, rules. So in these areas, one can say that the Commission is the architect of uh, European legislative system. Uh, about the composition of the Commission, uh, it's very important symbolically for the member states that each of them re uh, nominates a candidate for a Commission, but formally the Commission is independent and, and the Commissioners take an oath of uh, independence when they uh, take office. As the EU has been growing over decades, uh, the Commission has also been growing and uh, several experts uh, think that uh, the Commission has perhaps uh, grown too large, that there are too many Commissioners and this uh, might need to be changed in order to make the institution function more effectively. Next, uh, the Council of the European Union. Is the institution empowered to take uh, decisions? In areas of uh, community method and uh, regulatory mode, uh, this happens by qualified majority vote. In other areas, uh, the Council takes decisions unanimously. And there is a number of different uh, configurations of the Council. For example, foreign ministers uh, meet uh, at the Foreign Affairs Council, ministers for the Environment at the Environment Council, there are also meetings at uh, lower levels uh, of uh, ambassadors and civil servants that uh, prepare the decisions to be taken by the ministers. And uh, the powers of the council also vary according to, to policy areas. And the strongest role uh, the council has in areas of intergovernmental cooperation, uh, namely common foreign and security policy and parts of uh, freedom, security and justice. And the Council is uh, supported by the General Secretariat, which uh, does the administrative work, quite like in the Commission. You have the Commissioners and you have the administrative uh, body, the bureaucrats who, who, uh, who prepare and implement uh, things. The European Council is an institution that uh, has uh, significantly changed recently. In the early days of integration, uh, it used to be just uh, occasional summit meetings of uh, heads of state or government. The meetings were chaired by rotating presidency, and you can imagine when there were six presidents or prime ministers sitting around the table, the atmosphere was uh, quite different from today when there are 28 persons with their, uh, with their uh, assistants. Uh, the European Council has been gradually gaining more powers and uh, informally rather than formally. But under the Lisbon Treaty, it actually became a formal institution of the EU. Until then, it was uh, called a body in the EU language. Uh, what so the Lisbon Treaty changed is also that uh, the European Council is nowadays chaired by a permanent uh, president and it is uh, Herman van Rompuy who uh, is the first, uh, first permanent president of the European Council. Uh, the role of, uh, of the European Council is, is defined as uh, uh, providing impetus to, to the general development of the EU, defining political guidelines, and uh, the European Council acts by consensus whereas its uh, decision-making powers are actually, according to the treaty, rather limited. And the European Parliament, again, an institution that has uh, gradually become more powerful. Uh, since uh, since uh, 1979, uh, it has been elected by direct elections it has been growing uh, in terms of uh, the number of uh, members of Parliament, MEPs. Currently the number is 754. And uh, where the Parliament uh, has uh, gained influence is uh, by increased use of uh, the so-called co-decision procedure, where uh, the Council and uh, the European Parliament adopt legislation by common agreement. 
And it is also very important uh, that the parliament has increased budgetary power. Nonetheless, uh, in spite of this increase of uh, the power of the parliament, the citizens are not impressed. They have become less and less active. The turnout uh, for EP elections has been decreasing steadily, election after election. It was 63% uh, in 1979, down to only 43% in uh, 2009. And uh, as you might know, the next uh, EP election will be held uh, next uh, spring at the time when uh, EU skepticism has been growing in uh, quite a few uh, member states. And uh, the next uh, EP election will therefore have uh, a particular significance uh, in uh, showing the direction of the European Union. It will be interesting to see whether this trend of uh, decreasing activeness of citizens will continue and whether the composition of the parliament in terms of uh, uh, parties will change uh, significantly since there are signs that uh, the EU skeptic uh, parties might uh, considerably strengthen their position, which might then further uh, delegitimize the European Union. Finally, there is the European Court of uh, Justice, uh, the, the judiciary arm of the institutions, which has uh, a significant role in ensuring the rule of law and uh, uniform application of EU law. And it has a very important role in, in cases where legal texts are disputed. Then it is the Court of Justice that gives an authoritative interpretation of how to apply EU law. And the Lisbon Treaty further extended the jurisdiction of, of uh, the Court of Justice, for example, in the, in the area of, uh, of uh, freedom, justice and security. Now, what has happened uh, during the Euro crisis? Serious crises uh, tend to put uh, democratic institutions under strain and uh, even more so probably on the EU level where the institutional structure is uh, very complex. And uh, so what happened uh, when, uh, when the crisis became really serious, there was need for emergency decision making at the European Council, which as I just uh, said, does not have uh, very extensive formal decision making powers suddenly became the key decision maker. And it has been gradually taking over executive powers in the area of national economic policies. In other words, it has been uh, constraining uh, the autonomy of national governments, of uh, members of the Eurozone. To some extent, it has been acting outside the EU legal framework, uh, not least because uh, the European Council simply is not able to, to uh, have much uh, legislative power. At the same time, uh, the role of the Commission has, has weakened. Although uh, one must say that as the crisis has proceeded and new mechanisms to deal with the crisis have been put in place, uh, the Commission has again uh, regained the role uh, as the institution that is in charge of implementing decisions. But where it has uh, lost uh, powers is uh, agenda setting. And the Commission used to have a much more important, uh, uh, important position as uh, the initiator, as, as the agenda setter. And this is a very significant uh, change in terms of inter-institutional powers in the EU. Also because of the crisis, the weight of the European Central Bank as an autonomous body has, has increased. And the bank has played an important role in, in uh, taking the crisis uh, decisions. Now, while these uh, changes uh, reflect an kind of emergency decision-making mode, they also reveal 
problems of more permanent nature in the design of, of the EU institutions and in particular the Eurozone institutions. So uh, there has been discussion about uh, possibly a need to yet again change the treaty in order to, to make, uh, make the system more uh, functionable. And uh, quite a few proposals uh, have been put on table in, in recent uh, discussions about how to reform uh, the institutional system. Some of those uh, require treaty change, others uh, can be actually implemented without uh, changing the treaty. One of the problems, uh, as I said, is that uh, the European Council has been taking over executive powers in the area of economic policies that formerly belonged to national governments. So in a way, the European Council has extended well beyond uh, the competence assigned to it by the Lisbon Treaty. And uh, it, what is also interesting, the Council has started to take decisions that immediately affect uh, the direct direction of, of national economic policies. So in a way it is acting like a European government, but at the same time it uh, lacks the unity, the continuity and the legitimacy that would be required from a true executive. So uh, there has been an acute concern over the legitimacy and democratic accountability and quite a few ideas aired about how to improve the situation. One of the proposals is uh, to move to a direct election of uh, the council president or, or having the council president elected by national parliaments, by some sort of college, maybe using the US system as a model which would then uh, strengthen uh, the, the legitimacy, the accountability of, uh, of the council president. Another alternative suggestion is, is to have the commission president uh, elected by EU citizens. But this proposal has been criticized because uh, the commission is actually not quite at the center of using political power in the EU. So uh, politicizing the commission might actually uh, not be favorable for the interinstitutional balance. The commission has the role of, uh, of an impartial uh, expert in a way in, in implementing, implementing decisions, uh, the role of, of uh, surveillance. So that uh, might be undermined if the commission were politicized. A further idea is to merge uh, the, the positions of Commission President and uh, Council President, which would create a very strong, uh, strong executive, but uh, then again it would be problematic for the interinstitutional division of, of uh, tasks. Uh, one possibility to um, increase accountability would be to empower uh, the European Parliament to give it more uh, control over the European Council and this is something that is uh, not really envisaged in, in the Lisbon Treaty. Then uh, it would also be possible to involve uh, national parliaments and this uh, does not necessarily require treaty change. Um, and probably it would be most effective to involve national parliaments more closely on the national level. And here Finland is a rather good example of, uh, of uh, uh, strong, close involvement of uh, the parliament in uh, decision making. Um, and uh, when a Finnish minister or prime minister goes to the meeting of the council or the European council in Brussels, he or she is always instructed, uh, instructed by, by the relevant parliamentary committee. So this is a rather good practice, but many other member states uh, lack uh, the same kind of uh, mechanism. Another problem is, is that uh, the system is, is uh, 
rather clumsy and uh, there would be scope to, to streamline the executive powers. Here again, a number of ideas have been put forward. Having a stronger presidency as such would, would uh, uh, perhaps smoothen uh, the procedures. Then a qualified majority vote might be used uh, more extensively in order to make it easier to reach uh, decisions with 28 member states. Then something I mentioned before, uh, the commission has grown rather, rather large, so uh, the number of uh, commissioners uh, might be reduced. Uh, this is uh, obviously an issue that is sensitive to the smaller member states uh, who uh, are not not willing to let go of having their own uh, commissioner. So um, there have been discussions of uh, some sort of uh, rotation or having uh, different levels of, of uh, commissioners uh, on a rotating basis so that each country would have its turn, but uh, the number of commissioners at each time would be, would be smaller. Now, what uh, complicates uh, the picture further is that uh, there is tendency towards uh, more differentiated integration. Uh, 17 countries are currently members of the Eurozone, whereas 11 are not. So there are Eurozone ins and Eurozone outs. At the same time, uh, most of the current Eurozone outs are expected to join the Eurozone at some point. Uh, Latvia will be the next country to, to um, join the Eurozone next year. And uh, the assumption is that uh, several other countries will follow. So there is uh, multi-speed integration in that sense. And uh, the, the principle for, uh, especially for the new countries that have recently joined the EU or, or are going to join, the principle has been that they, while joining, adopt uh, the whole body of EU legislation and they become uh, members also of the Eurozone, if not immediately, then uh, when they are ready to do it. Whether this principle will hold uh, remains to be seen because several of the um, newer member states are quite uh, hesitant about uh, joining the Eurozone at the moment. Poland, for example, or Bulgaria, they are not very enthusiastic about uh, joining. And in the case of Latvia, the population is uh, clearly against joining the Eurozone at this point of time, although uh, the government has been very strongly pushing this issue. So here again we have this problem of uh, the EU not being very well connected to the citizens and having the problem to legitimize what it does. There have been discussions about uh, moving more clearly towards a multi-level system in order to address the situation where you have countries that want to be part of the inner core and you have others that uh, uh, would rather stay in some sort of outer circle. Of course, the UK is, is a case in point, uh, a country that definitely would rather see itself uh, outside the inner core. Um, then there have been uh, suggestions that the, the outer circle might even include countries that are currently not members of the EU, such as Turkey, whether uh, the UK would be happy about being placed in the same basket with Turkey and perhaps some other EU outsiders uh, is again a difficult question. But this whole, uh, whole discussion uh, has been handled very cautiously uh, on, on the official level and, and uh, if there were to be an outer circle this would have to mean not only lighter responsibilities but also uh, more limited rights as, as member states, which is the more problematic part uh, from the viewpoint of the countries that might be potentially interested. And so far there has been rather limited political will to actually move in that direction and the idea is that uh, the inner core uh, 
that is constructed around the Eurozone remains open to any member state willing to join and that no permanent uh, multi-level structures would be created. Thank you. I will stop here.